Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 13 through 15 Chapter 13 Wheelbarrow Next morning, Monday, after disposing of the embalmed head to a barber for a block, I settled my own and comrade's bill, using, however, my comrade's money. The grinning landlord, as well as the boarders, seemed amazingly tickled at the sudden friendship which had sprung up between me and Queequeg, especially as Peter Coffin's cock-and-bull stories about him had previously so much alarmed me concerning the very person whom I now accompanied with. We borrowed a wheelbarrow, and embarking our things, including my own poor carpet-bag and Queequeg's canvas sack and hammock, away went down to the moss, a little Nantucket packet schooner moored at the wharf. As we were going along, the people stared, not at Queequeg so much, for they were used to seeing cannibals like him in their streets, but at seeing him and me on such confidential terms. But we heeded them not, going along wheeling the barrow by turns, and Queequeg now and then stopping to adjust the sheath on his harpoon barbs. I asked him why he carried such a troublesome thing with him ashore, and whether all whaling ships did not find their own harpoons. To this, in substance, he replied that, though what I hinted was true enough, yet he had a particular affection for his own harpoon, because it was of assured stuff, well tried in many a mortal combat, and deeply intimate with the hearts of whales. In short, like many inland reapers and mowers, who go into the farmer's meadows armed with their own scythes, though in no wise obliged to furnish them, even so Queequeg, for his own private reasons, preferred his own harpoon. Shifting the barrow from my hand to his, he told me a funny story about the first wheelbarrow he had ever seen. It was in Sag Harbor. The owners of his ship, it seems, had lent him one, in which to carry his heavy chest to his boarding-house. Not to seem ignorant about the thing, though in truth he was entirely so, concerning the precise way in which to manage the barrow, Queequeg put his chest upon it, lashes it fast, and then shoulders the barrow and marches up the wharf. Why, said I, Queequeg, you might have known better than that, one would think. Didn't the people laugh? Upon this he told me another story. The people of his island of Cocovoco, it seems, at their wedding feasts, express the fragrant water of young coconuts into a large stained calabash, like a punch-bowl, and this punch-bowl always forms the great central ornament on the braided mat where the feast is held. Now a certain grand merchant ship once touched at Cocovoco, and its commander, uh, from all accounts a very stately punctilious gentleman, at least for a sea captain, this commander was invited to the wedding feast of Queequeg's sister, a pretty young princess just turned of ten. Well, when all the wedding guests were assembled at the bride's bamboo cottage, this captain marches in, and being assigned the post of honor, placed himself over against the punch-bowl, and between the high priest and his majesty the king, Queequeg's father. Grace being said, for those people have grace as well as we, though Queequeg told me that unlike us, who at such times look downward to our platters, they, on the contrary, copying the ducks, glance upward to the great giver of all feasts. Grace, I say, being said, the high priest opens the banquet by the immemorial ceremony of the island, that is, dipping his consecrated and consecrating fingers into the bowl before the blessed beverage circulates. Seeing himself placed next to the priest, and noting the ceremony, and thinking himself, being captain of a ship, as having plain precedence over a mere island king, especially in the king's own house, the captain coolly proceeds to wash his hands in the punch-bowl, taking it, I suppose, for a huge finger-glass. Now, said Queequeg, what do you think now? Didn't our people laugh? At last, passage paid and luggage safe, we stood on board the schooner. Hoisting sail, it glided down the Akushnet River. On one side New Bedford rose in terraces of streets, their ice-covered trees all glittering in the clear, cold air. Huge hills and mountains of casks on casks were piled upon her wharves, and side by side the world-wandering whale-ships lay silent and safely moored at last, while from others came a sound of carpenters and coopers, with blended noises of fires and forges to melt the pitch, all betokening that new cruises were on the start, 
that one most perilous and long voyage ended only begins a second, and a second ended only begins a third, and so on, forever and for aye. Such is the endlessness, yea, the intolerableness, of all earthly effort. Gaining the more open water, the bracing breeze waxed fresh. The little moss tossed the quick foam from her bows as a young colt his snortings. How I snuffed that tartar air! How I spurned that turnpike earth, that common highway all over dented with the marks of slavish heels and hoofs, and turned me to admire the magnanimity of the sea which will permit no records. At the same foam fountain, Queequeg seemed to drink and reel with me. His dusky nostrils swelled apart, he showed his filed and pointed teeth. On, on we flew, and, our offing gained, the moss did homage to the blast, ducked and dived her bows as a slave before the sultan. Sideways leaning, we sideways darted, every rope-yarn tingling like a wire, the two tall masts buckling like Indian canes in land tornadoes. So full of this reeling scene were we, as we stood by the plunging bowsprit, that for some time we did not notice the jeering glances of the passengers, a lubber-like assembly, who marvelled that two fellow beings should be so companionable, as though a white man were anything more dignified than a whitewashed negro. But there were some boobies and bumpkins there, who, by their intense greenness, must have come from the heart and centre of all verdure. Queequeg caught one of these young saplings, mimicking him behind his back. I thought the bumpkin's hour of doom was come. Dropping his harpoon, the brawny savage caught him in his arms, and by an almost miraculous dexterity and strength sent him high up bodily into the air. Then, slightly tapping his stern in mid-somerset, the fellow landed with bursting lungs upon his feet, while Queequeg, turning his back upon him, lighted his tomahawk pipe and passed it to me for a puff. "'Captain! Captain!' yelled the bumpkin, running towards that officer. "'Captain! Captain! Here's the devil!' "'Hello, you, sir!' cried the captain, a gaunt rib of the sea, stalking up to Queequeg. "'What in thunder do you mean by that? Don't you know you might have killed that chap?' "'What him say?' said Queequeg, as he mildly turned to me. "'He say,' said I, "'that you came near Killy that man there.' pointing to the still shivering greenhorn. Gilly, cried Queequeg, twisting his tattooed face into an unearthly expression of disdain. Ah, him bevy small fishy. Queequeg no killy so smally fishy. Queequeg killy big whale. Look you, roared the captain, I'll killy you, you cannibal, if you try any more of your tricks aboard here, so mind your eye. But it so happened just then that it was high time for the captain to mind his own eye. The prodigious strain upon the mainsail had parted the weather sheet, and the tremendous boom was now flying from side to side, completely sweeping the entire after part of the deck. The poor fellow whom Queequeg had handled so roughly was swept overboard. All hands were in a panic, and to attempt snatching at the boom to stay it seemed madness. It flew from right to left and back again, almost in one ticking of a watch, and every instant seemed on the point of snapping into splinters. Nothing was done, and nothing seemed capable of being done. Those on deck rushed toward the bows and stood eyeing the boom as if it were the lower jaw of an exasperated whale. In the midst of this consternation, Queequeg dropped deftly to his knees, and crawling under the path of the boom, whipped hold of a rope, secured one end to the bulwarks, and then flinging the other like a lasso, caught it round the boom as it swept over his head, and at the next jerk the spar was that way trapped and all was safe. The schooner was run into the wind, and while the hands were clearing away the stern-boat, Queequeg, stripped to the waist, darted from the side with a long living arc of a leap. For three minutes or more he was seen swimming like a dog, throwing his long arms straight out before him, and by turns revealing his brawny shoulders through the freezing foam. I looked at the grand and glorious fellow, but saw no one to be saved. The greenhorn had gone down. Shooting himself perpendicularly from the water, Queequeg now took an instant's glance around him, and seeming to see just how matters were, dived down and disappeared. A few minutes more, and he rose again, one arm still striking out, and with the other dragging a lifeless form. The boat soon picked them up. 
the poor bumpkin was restored. All hands voted Queequeg a noble trump. The captain begged his pardon. From that hour I clove to Queequeg like a barnacle. Yea, till poor Queequeg took his last long dive. Was there ever such unconsciousness? He did not seem to think that he had all deserved a medal from the humane and magnanimous societies. He only asked for water, fresh water, something to wipe the brine off. That done, he put on dry clothes, lighted his pipe, and leaning against the bulwarks and mildly eyeing those around him, seemed to be saying to himself, It's a mutual joint-stock world in all meridians. We cannibals must help these Christians. Chapter 14 Nantucket Nothing more happened on the passage worthy of mentioning, so after a fine run we safely arrived in Nantucket. Nantucket! Take out your map and look at it. See what a real corner of the world it occupies, how it stands there, away offshore, more lonely than the Eddystone lighthouse. Look at it, a mere hillock and elbow of sand, all beach and without a background. There is more sand there than you would use in twenty years as a substitute for blotting paper. Some gamesome whites will tell you that they have to plant weeds there, that they don't grow naturally, that they import Canada thistles, that they have to send beyond seas for a spile to stop a leak in an oil cask, that pieces of wood in Nantucket are carried about like bits of the true cross in Rome, that people there plant toadstools before their house to get under the shade in summer time, that one blade of grass makes an oasis, three blades in a day's walk a prairie, that they wear quicksand shoes, something like Laplander snowshoes, that they are so shut up, belted about, every way enclosed, surrounded, and made an utter island of by the ocean, that to their very chairs and tables small clams will sometimes be found adhering, as to the backs of sea-turtles. But these extravaganzas only show that Nantucket is no Illinois. Look now at the wondrous traditional story of how this island was settled by the red man. Thus goes the legend. In olden times an eagle swooped down upon the New England coast, and carried off an infant Indian in its talons. With loud laments the parents saw their child borne out of sight over the wide waters. They resolved to follow in the same direction. Setting out in their canoes, after a perilous passage, they discovered the island, and there they found an empty ivory casket, the poor little Indian's skeleton. What wonder, then, that these Nantucketers, born on a beach, should take to the sea for a livelihood? They first caught crabs and quahogs in the sand. Grown bolder, they waded out with nets for mackerel. More experienced, they pushed off in boats and captured cod, and at last, launching a navy of great ships on the sea, explored this watery world, put an incessant belt of circumnavigations round it, peeped in at Bering Straits, and in all seasons and all oceans declared everlasting war with the mightiest animated mass that has survived the flood, most monstrous and most mountainous, that Himalayan salt sea mastodon, clothed with such portentousness of unconscious power, that his very panics are more to be dreaded than his most fearless and malicious assaults. And thus of these naked Nantucketers, these sea hermits, issuing from their anthill in the sea, overrun and conquered the watery world like so many Alexanders, parceling out among them the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans, as the three pirate powers did Poland. Let America add Mexico to Texas, and pile Cuba upon Canada. Let the English overswarm all India, and hang out their blazing banner from the sun. Two-thirds of this terraqueous globe are the Nantucketers. For the sea is his, he owns it, as emperors own empires, other seamen having but a right of way through it. Merchant ships are but extension bridges, armed ones but floating forts. Even pirates and privateers, though following the sea as highwaymen the road, they but plunder other ships, other fragments of the land like themselves, without seeking to draw their living from the bottomless deep itself. The Nantucketer, he alone resides and riots on the sea. He alone, in Bible language, goes down to it in ships, to and fro ploughing it as his own special plantation. There is his home, there lies his business, which a Noah's flood would not interrupt, 
though it overwhelmed all the millions in China. He lives on the sea as prairie cocks in the prairie. He hides among the waves. He climbs them as chamois hunters climb the Alps. For years he knows not the land, so that when he comes to it at last, it smells like another world, more strangely than the moon would to an earthman. With the landless gull that at sunset folds her wings and is rocked to sleep between billows, so at nightfall the Nantucketer, out of sight of land, furls his sails and lays him to his rest, while under his very pillow rush herds of walruses and whales. CHAPTER Fifteen, CHOWDER It was quite late in the evening when the little moss came snugly to anchor, and Queequeg and I went ashore, so we could attend to no business that day, at least none but a supper and a bed. The landlord of the Spouter Inn had recommended us to his cousin, Hosea Hussey, of the Tripots, whom he asserted to be the proprietor of one of the best-kept hotels in all Nantucket, and moreover he had assured us— that cousin hosea as he called him was famous for his chowders in short he plainly hinted that we could not possibly do better than try potluck at the tripots but the directions he had given us about keeping a yellow warehouse on our starboard hand till we opened a white church to the larboard and then keeping that on the larboard hand till we made a corner three points to the starboard and that done then asked the first man we met where the place was these crooked directions of his very much puzzled us at first, especially as at the outset Queequeg insisted that the yellow warehouse, our first point of departure, must be left on the larboard hand, whereas I had understood Peter Coffin to say it was on the starboard. However, by dint of beating about a little in the dark, and now and then knocking up a peaceable inhabitant to inquire the way, we at last came to something which there was no mistaking." Two enormous wooden pots, painted black, and suspended by asses' ears, swung from the cross-trees of an old topmast, planted in front of an old doorway. The horns of the cross-trees were sawed off on the other side, so that this old topmast looked not a little like the gallows. Perhaps I was oversensitive to such impressions at the time, but I could not help staring at this gallows with vague misgiving. A sort of crick was in my neck as I gazed up to the two remaining horns. Yes, two of them, one for Queequeg and one for me. It's ominous, thinks I. A coffin, my innkeeper, upon landing in my first whaling port, tombstone staring at me in the whaleman's chapel, and here a gallows, and a pair of prodigious black pots, too. Are these last throwing out oblique hints touching Tophet? I was called from these reflections by the sight of a freckled woman with yellow hair and a yellow gown, standing in the porch of the inn under a dull red lamp swinging there, that looked much like an injured eye, and carrying on a brisk scolding with a man in a purple woolen shirt. "'Get along with ye,' she said to the man, "'or I'll be combing ye.' "'Come on, Queequeg,' said I. "'All right, there's Mrs. Hussey.' And so it turned out, Mr. Hosea Hussey being from home, but leaving Mrs. Hussey entirely competent to attend to all his affairs. Upon making known our desires for supper and a bed, Mrs. Hussey, postponing further scolding for the present, ushered us into a little room, and seating us at a table spread with the relics of a recently concluded repast, turned round to us and said, "'Clam or cod?' "'What's that about cods, ma'am?' said I, with much politeness. "'Clam or cod?' she repeated. "'A clam for supper. A cold clam. Is that what you mean, Mrs. Hussey?' says I. "'But that's a rather cold and clammy reception in the winter time, ain't it, Mrs. Hussey?' But being in a great hurry to resume scolding the man in the purple shirt, who was waiting for it in the entry, and seeming to hear nothing but the word clam, Mrs. Hussey hurried towards an open door leading to the kitchen, and bawling out, "'Clam for two! disappeared. "'Queequeg,' said I, "'do you think that we can make out a supper for us both on one clam?' However, a warm and savoury steam from the kitchen served to belie the apparently cheerless prospect before us. But when that smoking chowder came in, the mystery was delightfully explained. "'Oh, sweet friends, hearken to me!' 
It was made of small, juicy clams, scarcely bigger than hazelnuts, mixed with pounded ship biscuit and salted pork cut up into little flakes, the whole enriched with butter and plentifully seasoned with pepper and salt. Our appetites being sharpened by the frosty voyage, and in particular Queequeg seeing his favorite fishing food before him, and the chowder being surpassingly excellent, we dispatched it with great expedition. When, leaning back a moment, and bethinking me of Mrs. Hussey's clam and cod announcement, I thought I would try a little experiment. Stepping to the kitchen door, I uttered the word, COD, with great emphasis, and resumed my seat. In a few moments, the savory steam came forth again, but with a different flavor, and in good time a fine cod chowder was placed before us. We resumed business, and, while plying our spoons in the bowl, thinks I to myself, I wonder now if this here has any effect on the head. What's that stultifying saying about chowder-headed people? But look, Queequeg, ain't that a live eel in your bowl? Where's your harpoon? Fishiest of all fishy places was the tripots, which well deserved its name, for the pots there were always boiling chowders. Chowder for breakfast, and chowder for dinner, and chowder for supper, till you began to look for fish bones coming through your clothes. The area before the house was paved with clam shells. Mrs. Hussey wore a polished necklace of codfish vertebrae, and Hosea Hussey had his account books bound in superior old shark skin. There was a fishy flavor to the milk, too, which I could not at all account for, till one morning, happening to take a stroll along the beach among some fishermen's boats, I saw Hosea's brindled cow feeding on fish remnants, and marching along the sand with each foot in a cod's decapitated head, looking very slipshod, I assure you. Supper concluded, we received a lamp, and directions from Mrs. Hussey concerning the nearest way to bed. But as Queequeg was about to precede me up the stairs, the lady reached forth her arm, and demanded his harpoon. She allowed no harpoon in her chambers. "'Why not?' said I. "'Every true whaleman sleeps with his harpoon. "'But why not?' "'Because it's dangerous,' says she. "'Ever since young Stiggs, coming from that unfortunate voyage of his, "'when he was gone four years and a half with only three barrels of ile, "'was found dead in my first floor back with his harpoon in his side. "'Ever since then I allow no boarders to take sich dangerous weapons in their rooms at night. "'So, Mr. Queequeg, for she had learned his name, I will just take this here iron and keep it for you till morning. But the chowder, clam or cod tomorrow for breakfast, men? Both, says I, and let's have a couple of smoked herring by way of variety. End of chapters 13 through 15、Chapter 16. The Ship In bed we concocted our plans for the morrow, but to my surprise and no small concern, Queequeg now gave me to understand that he had been diligently consulting Yojo, the name of his black little god, and Yojo had told him two or three times over, and strongly insisted upon it every way, that instead of our going together among the whaling fleet in the harbor, and in concert selecting our craft, Instead of this, I say, Yojo earnestly enjoined that the selection of the ship should rest wholly with me, inasmuch as Yojo proposed befriending us, and, in order to do so, had already pitched upon a vessel, which, if left to myself, I, Ishmael, should infallibly light upon, for all the world as though it had turned out by chance, and in that vessel I must immediately ship myself, for the present irrespective of Queequeg. I have forgotten to mention that in many things Queequeg placed great confidence in the excellence of Yojo's judgment and surprising forecast of things, and cherished Yojo with considerable esteem, as a rather good sort of god who perhaps meant well enough upon the whole, but in all cases did not succeed in his benevolent designs. Now this plan of Queequeg's, or rather Yojo's, touching the selection of our craft, I did not like that plan at all. I had not a little relied upon Queequeg's sagacity to point out the whaler best fitted to carry us and our fortunes securely. But as all my remonstrances produced no effect upon Queequeg, I was obliged to acquiesce, 
and accordingly prepared to set about this business with a determined rushing sort of energy and vigor that should quickly settle that trifling little affair. Next morning, early, leaving Queequeg shut up with Yojo in our little bedroom, for it seemed that it was some sort of Lent or Ramadan or day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer with Queequeg and Yojo that day. How it was I never could find out, for though I applied myself to it several times I never could master his liturgies and thirty-nine articles. Leaving Queequeg then, fasting on his tomahawk pipe, and Yojo warming himself at his sacrificial fire of shavings, I sallied out among the shipping. After much prolonged sauntering and many random inquiries, I learnt that there were three ships up for three years' voyages, the Devil Dam, the Titbit, and the Pequod. Devil Dam I do not know the origin of, Titbit is obvious, Pequod, you will no doubt remember, was the name of a celebrated tribe of Massachusetts Indians, now extinct as the ancient Medes. I peered and pried about the Devil Dam, from her hopped over to the Titbit, and finally going on board the Pequod, looked around her for a moment, and then decided that this was the very ship for us. You may have seen many a quaint craft in your day, for aught I know, square-toed luggers, mountainous Japanese junks, butter-box galliots, and what not, but take my word for it, you never saw such a rare old craft as this same rare old Pequod. She was a ship of the old school, rather small, if anything, with an old-fashioned claw-footed look about her, long-seasoned and weather-stained in typhoons and calms of all four oceans, her old hull's complexion was darkened like a French grenadier's, who has alike fought in Egypt and Siberia. Her venerable bows looked bearded. Her masts, cut somewhere on the coasts of Japan, where her original ones were lost overboard in a gale, her masts stood stiffly up like the spines of the three old kings of Cologne. Her ancient decks were worn and wrinkled like the pilgrim-worshipped flagstone in Canterbury Cathedral where Becket bled. But to all these, her old antiquities, were added new and marvellous features, pertaining to the wild business that for more than half a century she had followed. Old Captain Peleg, many years her chief mate, before he commanded another vessel of his own, and now a retired seaman and one of the principal owners of the Pequod, this old Peleg, during the term of his chief mateship, had built upon her original grotesqueness and inlaid it all over, with a quaintness both of material and device, unmatched by anything except it be Thorkill Hake's carved buckler or bedstead. She was apparelled like any barbaric Ethiopian emperor, his neck heavy with pendants of polished ivory. She was a thing of trophies, a cannibal of a craft, tricking herself forth in the chaste bones of her enemies. All round her unpanelled open bulwarks were garnished like one continuous jaw, with the long sharp teeth of the sperm whale inserted there for pins to fasten her old hempen thews and tendons to. Those thews ran not through base blocks of land wood, but deftly travelled over sheaves of sea ivory, Scorning a turnstile wheel at her reverend helm, she sported there a tiller, and that tiller was in one mass, curiously carved from the long, narrow lower jaw of her hereditary foe. The helmsman who steered by that tiller in a tempest felt like the tartar when he holds back his fiery steed by clutching its jaw. A noble craft, but somehow a most melancholy. All noble things are touched with that. Now, when I looked about the quarter-deck for someone having authority in order to propose myself as a candidate for the voyage, at first I saw nobody. But I could not well overlook a strange sort of tent, or rather wigwam, pitched a little behind the mainmast. It seemed only a temporary erection used in port. It was of a conical shape, some ten feet high, consisting of the long, huge slabs of limber black bone taken from the middle and highest part of the jaws of the right whale. Planted with their broad ends on the deck, a circle of these slabs, laced together, mutually sloped towards each other, 
and at the apex united in a tufted point where the loose hairy fibres waved to and fro like the topknot on some old Potawatomi sachem's head. A triangular opening faced towards the bows of the ship, so that the insider commanded a complete view forward. And half concealed in this queer tenement, I at length found one who, by his aspect, seemed to have authority, and who, it being noon, and the ship's work suspended, was now enjoying respite from the burden of command. He was seated on an old-fashioned oaken chair, wriggling all over with curious carving, and the bottom of which was formed of a stout interlacing of the same elastic stuff of which the wigwam was constructed. There was nothing so very particular, perhaps, about the appearance of the elderly man I saw. He was brown and brawny, like most old seamen, and heavily rolled up in blue pilot-cloth, cut in the Quaker style. Only there was a fine and almost microscopic network of the minutest wrinkles interlacing round his eyes, which must have arisen from his continual sailings and many hard gales, and always looking to windward, for this causes the muscles about the eyes to become pursed together. Such eye-wrinkles are very effectual in a scowl. "'Is this the captain of the Pequod?' said I, advancing to the door of the tent. "'Supposing it be the captain of the Pequod, what dost thou want of him?' he demanded. "'I was thinking of shipping.' "'Thou wast, wast thou? I see thou art no Nantucketer. Ever been in a stove-boat?' "'No, sir, I never have.' "'Dost know nothing at all about whaling, I dare say, eh?' "'Nothing, sir, but I have no doubt I soon shall learn. I've been several voyages in the merchant service, and I think that merchant service be damned. Talk not that lingo to me. Dost see that leg?' I'll take that leg away from thy stern, if ever thou talkest of the marchant service to me again. Marchant service, indeed. I suppose now ye feel considerable proud of having served in those marchant ships. But flukes, man, what makes thee want to go a-wailing, eh? It looks a little suspicious, don't it, eh? Hast not been a pirate, hast thou? Didst not rob thy last captain, didst thou? Didst not think of murdering the officers when thou gettest to sea? I protested my innocence of these things. I saw that under the mask of these half-humorous innuendos, this old seaman, as an insulated Quakerish Nantucketer, was full of his insular prejudices, and rather distrustful of all aliens unless they hailed from Cape Cod or the vineyard. But what takes thee a-wailing? I want to know that before I think of shipping ye. "'Well, sir, I want to see what whaling is. I want to see the world.' "'Want to see what whaling is, eh? Have you clapped an eye on Captain Ahab?' "'Who is Captain Ahab, sir?' "'Aye, aye, I thought so. Captain Ahab is the captain of this ship?' "'I am mistaken, then. I thought I was speaking to the captain himself.' "'Thou art speaking to Captain Peleg. That's who you are speaking to, young man.' It belongs to me and Captain Bildad to see the Pequod fitted out for the voyage and supplied with all her needs, including crew. We are part owners and agents. But as I was going to say, if thou wantest to know what whaling is, as thou tellest ye do, I can put ye in the way of finding it out before ye bind yourself to it past backing out. Clap eye on Captain Ahab, young man, and thou wilt find that he has only one leg." "'What do you mean, sir? Was the other lost by a whale?' "'Lost by a whale! Young man, come nearer to me. "'It was devoured, chewed up, crunched by the monstrousest parmacetti that ever chipped a boat. "'Ah! Ah!' "'I was a little alarmed by his energy, perhaps also a little touched at the hearty grief in his concluding exclamation.' but said as calmly as I could, "'What you say is no doubt true enough, sir, but how could I know there was any peculiar ferocity in that particular whale, though indeed I might have inferred as much from the simple fact of the accident?' "'Now look ye, young man, thy lungs are a sort of a soft, do you see? Thou dost not talk shark a bit. Sure you've been to sea before now, sure of that.' "'Sir,' said I, "'I thought I told you that I had been four voyages in the merchant—' "'Hard down on that! 
Mind what I said about the marchant service. Don't aggravate me. I won't have it. But let us understand each other. I have given thee a hint about what whaling is. Do you yet feel inclined for it? I do, sir. Very good. Now art thou the man to pitch a harpoon down a live whale's throat, and then jump after it? Answer quick. I am, sir, if it should be positively indispensable to do so, not to be got rid of, that is, which I don't take to be the fact. Good again. Now then, thou not only wantest to go whaling to find out by experience what whaling is, but ye also want to go in order to see the world. Was that not what ye said? I thought so. Well then, just step forward there and take a peep over the weather bow, and then back to me and tell me what ye see there. For a moment I stood a little puzzled by this curious request, not knowing exactly how to take it, whether humorously or in earnest. But concentrating all his crow's feet into one scowl, Captain Peleg started me on the errand. Going forward and glancing over the weather bow, I perceived that the ship swinging to her anchor with the flood tide was now obliquely pointing towards the open ocean. The prospect was unlimited, but exceedingly monotonous and forbidding not the slightest variety that I could see. "'Well, what's the report?' said Peleg, when I came back. "'What did you see?' "'Not much,' I replied. "'Nothing but water. Considerable horizon, though, and there's a squall coming up, I think. "'Well, what dost thou think, then, of seeing the world? Do you wish to go round Cape Horn to see any more of it, eh? Can't you see the world where you stand?' I was a little staggered, but go a whaling I must, and I would, and the Pequod was as good a ship as any, I thought the best, and all this I now repeated to Peleg. Seeing me so determined, he expressed his willingness to ship me. "'And thou mayest as well sign the papers right off,' he added. "'Come along with ye,' and so saying he led the way below deck into the cabin." Seated on the transom was what seemed to me a most uncommon and surprising figure. It turned out to be Captain Bildad, who, along with Captain Peleg, was one of the largest owners of the vessel, the other shares, as is sometimes the case in these ports, being held by a crowd of old annuitants, widows, fatherless children, and chancery wards, each owning about the value of a timber-head or a foot of plank or a nail or two in the ship, People in Nantucket invest their money in whaling vessels the same way that you do yours in approved state stocks bringing in good interest. Now Bildad, like Peleg, and indeed many other Nantucketers, was a Quaker, the island having been originally settled by that sect. And to this day its inhabitants, in general, retain in an uncommon measure the peculiarities of the Quaker only variously and anomalously modified by things altogether alien and heterogeneous. For some of these same Quakers are the most sanguinary of all sailors and whale-hunters. They are fighting Quakers. They are Quakers with a vengeance. So that there are instances among them of men who, named with scripture names, a singularly common fashion on the island, and in childhood naturally imbibing the stately dr dramatic thee and thou of the Quaker idiom, still from the audacious daring and boundless adventure of their subsequent lives, strangely blend with these unoutgrown pe peculiarities a thousand bold dashes of character not unworthy of a Scandinavian sea-king or a poetical pagan Roman. And when these things unite in a man of greatly superior natural force, with a globular brain and a ponderous heart, who has also by the stillness and seclusion of many long night watches in the remotest waters, and beneath constellations never seen here at the north, been led to think untraditionally and independently, receiving all nature's sweet or savage impressions fresh from her own virgin, voluntary, and confiding breast, and thereby chiefly, but with some help from accidental advantages, to learn a bold and nervous lofty language, that man makes one in a whole nation census, a mighty pageant creature formed for noble tragedies. 
nor will it at all detract from him, dramatically regarded, if either by birth or other circumstances, he have what seems a half-wilful overruling morbidness at the bottom of his nature. For all men tragically great are made so through a certain morbidness. Be sure of this, O young ambition, all mortal greatness is but disease. But as yet we have not to do with such a one, but with quite another, and still a man who, if indeed peculiar, it only results again from another phase of the Quaker, modified by individual circumstances. Like Captain Peleg, Captain Bildad was a well-to-do, retired whaleman. But unlike Captain Peleg, who cared not a rush for what are called serious things, and indeed deemed those self-same serious things the veriest of all trifles, Captain Bildad had not only been originally educated according to the strictest sect of Nantucket Quakerism, but all his subsequent ocean life, and the sight of many unclad lovely island creatures round the horn, all that had not moved this native-born Quaker one single jot, had not so much as altered one angle of his vest. Still, for all this immutableness, there was some lack of common consistency about the worthy Captain Bildad. Though refusing from conscientious scruples to bear arms against land invaders, yet himself had illimitably invaded the Atlantic and Pacific, and, though a sworn foe to human bloodshed, yet had he, in his straight-bodied coat, spilled tons upon tons of leviathan gore. How now, in the contemplative evening of his days, the pious Bildad reconciled these things in his reminiscence, I do not know, but it did not seem to concern him much, and very probably he had long since come to the sage and sensible conclusion that a man's religion is one thing, and this practical world quite another. This world pays dividends. Rising from a little cabin boy in short clothes of the drabbest drab to a harpooner in the broad shad-bellied waistcoat, from that becoming boat-header, chief mate, and captain, and finally a ship-owner, Bildad, as I hinted before, had concluded his adventurous career by wholly retiring from active life at the goodly age of sixty, and dedicating his remaining days to the quiet receiving of his well-earned income. Now Bildad, I am sorry to say, had the reputation of being an incorrigible old hunks, and in his sea-going days a bitter, hard taskmaster. They told me in Nantucket, though it certainly seems a curious story, that when he sailed the old Cattegut whaleman, his crew, upon arriving home, were mostly all carried ashore to the hospital, sore exhausted and worn out. For a pious man, especially for a Quaker, he was certainly rather hard-hearted, to say the least. He never used to swear, though, at his men, they said. But somehow he got an inordinate quantity of cruel, unmitigated hard work out of them. When Bildad was a chief mate, to have his drab-coloured eye intently looking at you made you feel completely nervous, till you could clutch something, a hammer or a marling spike, and go to work like mad at something or other, never mind what. Indolence and idleness perished before him. His own person was the exact embodiment of his utilitarian character. On his long, gaunt body he carried no spare flesh, no superfluous beard, his chin having a soft, economical nap to it, like the worn nap of his broad-brimmed hat. Such, then, was the person that I saw seated on the transom when I followed Captain Peleg down into the cabin. The space between the decks was small, and there, bolt upright, sat old Bildad, who always sat so, and never leaned, and this to save his coat-tails. His broad brim was placed beside him, his legs were stiffly crossed, his drab vesture was buttoned up to his chin, and spectacles on nose he seemed absorbed in reading from a ponderous volume. "'Bildad!' cried Captain Peleg. "'At it again, Bildad, eh?' You've been studying those scriptures now for the last thirty years, to my certain knowledge. How far you get, Bildad? As if long habituated to such profane talk from his old shipmate, Bildad, without noticing his present irreverence, quietly looked up, and seeing me, glanced again inquiringly towards Peleg. He says he's our man, Bildad, said Peleg. He wants to ship. Dost thee, said Bildad in a hollow tone and turning round to me. "'I dust,' 
said I unconsciously, he was so intense a Quaker. "'What do you think of him, Bildad?' said Peleg. "'He'll do,' said Bildad, eyeing me, and then went on spelling away at his book in a mumbling tone quite audible. I thought him the queerest old Quaker I ever saw, especially as Peleg, his friend and old shipmate, seemed such a blusterer. But I said nothing, only looking round me sharply. Peleg now threw open a chest, and drawing forth the ship's articles, placed pen and ink before him, and seated himself at a little table. I began to think it was high time to settle with myself at what terms I would be willing to engage for the voyage. I was already aware that in the whaling business they paid no wages, but all hands, including the captain, received certain shares of the profit called lays and that these lays were proportioned to the degree of importance pertaining to the respective duties of the ship's company. I was also aware that being a green hand at whaling, my own lay could not be very large, but considering that I was used to the sea, could steer a ship, splice a rope, and all that, I made no doubt that from all I had heard I should be offered at least the 275th lay, that is, the 275th part of the clear net proceeds of the voyage, whatever that might eventually amount to. And though the 275th lay was what they call a rather long lay, yet it was better than nothing, and if we had a lucky voyage might pretty nearly pay for the clothing I would wear out on it, not to speak of my three years' beef and board for which I would not have to pay one stiver. It might be thought that this was a very poor way to accumulate a princely fortune, and so it was, a very poor way indeed, but I am one of those that never take on about princely fortunes, and am quite content if the world is ready to board and lodge me, while I am putting up at this grim sign of the thundercloud. Upon the whole, I thought that the 275th lay would be about the fair thing, but I would not have been surprised if I had been offered the 200th, considering I was of a broad-shouldered make. But one thing, nevertheless, that made me a little distrustful about receiving a generous share of the profits was this. Ashore I had heard something of both Captain Peleg and his unaccountable old crony Bildad, how that they, being the principal proprietors of the Pequod, therefore the other and more inconsiderable scattered owners left nearly the whole management of the ship's affairs to these two and I did not know but what the stingy old Bildad might have a mighty deal to say about shipping hands, especially as I now found him on board the Pequod, quite at home there in the cabin, and reading his Bible as if at his own fireside. Now, while Peleg was vainly trying to mend a pen with his jackknife, old Bildad, to my no small surprise, considering that he was such an interested party in these proceedings, Bildad never heeded us, but went on mumbling to himself out of his book, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where mo— Well, Captain Bildad, interrupted Peleg, what do you say? What lay shall we give this young man? Thou knowest best, was the sepulchral reply. The seven hundred and seventy-seventh wouldn't be too much, would it? Where moth and rust do corrupt, but lay— Lay, indeed, thought I, and such a lay, the seven hundred and seventy-seventh. Well, old Bildad, you are determined that I, for one, shall not lay up many lays here below, where moth and rust do corrupt. It was an exceedingly long lay, that indeed, and though from the magnitude of the figure it might at first deceive the landsman, yet the slightest consideration will show that though seven hundred and seventy-seven is a pretty large number, yet when you come to make a tenth of it, you will see, as I say, that the seven hundred and seventy-seventh part of a farthing is a good deal less than seven hundred seventy-seven gold doubloons, and so thought I at the time. "'I blast your eyes, Bildad!' cried Peleg. "'Thou dost not want to swindle this young man. He must have more than that.' Seven hundred and seventy-seventh, again said Bildad, without lifting his eyes, and then went on mumbling, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I am going to put him down for the three hundredth, said Peleg. Do you hear that, Bildad? The three hundredth lay, I say. Bildad lay down his book, and turning solemnly towards him, said, Captain Peleg, thou hast a generous heart, 
but thou must consider the duty thou owest to the other owners of this ship, widows and orphans, many of them, and that if we too abundantly reward the labours of this young man, we may be taking bread from those widows and those orphans. The seven hundred and seventy-seventh lay, Captain Peleg. "'Thou Bildad!' roared Peleg, starting up and clattering about the cabin. "'Blast ye, Captain Bildad, if I had followed thy advice in these matters, I would afore now had a conscience to lug about, and would be heavy enough to founder the largest ship that ever sailed round Cape Horn.' "'Captain Peleg,' said Bildad steadily, "'thy conscience may be drawing ten inches of water, or ten fathoms, I can't tell.' But as thou art still an impenitent man, Captain Peleg, I greatly fear, lest thy conscience be but a leaky one, and will in the end sink thee foundering down to the fiery pit, Captain Peleg. Fiery pit! Fiery pit! Ye insult me, man! Past all natural bearing ye insult me! It's an all-fired outrage to tell any human creature that he's bound to hell! Flukes and flames, Bildad! Say that again to me, and start my soul bolts, I'll, I'll, yes, I'll swallow a live goat with all his hair and horns on. Out of the cabin, ye canting, drab-colored son of a wooden gun. A straight wake with ye. As he thundered out this, he made a rush at Bildad, but with a marvelous oblique sliding celerity, Bildad for that time eluded him. Alarmed at this terrible outburst between the two principal and responsible owners of the ship, and feeling half a mind to give up all idea of sailing in a vessel so questionably owned and temporarily commanded, I stepped aside from the door to give egress to Bildad, who, I made no doubt, was all eagerness to vanish before the awakened wrath of Peleg. But to my astonishment he sat down again on the transom very quietly, and seemed to have not the slightest intention of withdrawing. He seemed quite used to the impenitent Peleg and his ways. As for Peleg, after letting off his rage as he had, there seemed no more left in him, and he too sat down like a lamb, though he twitched a little as if still nervously agitated. Whew! he whistled at last. A squall's gone off to leeward, I think. Bildad, thou used to be good at sharpening a lance. Mend that pen, will you? My jackknife here needs the grindstone. That's he, thank you, Bildad. Now then, my young man, Ishmael's thy name, didn't you say? Well then, down you go here, Ishmael, for the three hundredth lay. Captain Peleg, said I, I have a friend with me who wants to ship too. Shall I bring him down tomorrow? To be sure, said Peleg. Fetch him along, and we'll look at him. What lay does he want? groaned Bildad glancing up from the book in which he had again been burying himself. "'Ah, never mind about that, Bildad,' said Peleg. "'Has he ever wailed at any?' turning to me. "'Killed more whales than I can count, Captain Peleg. "'Well, bring him along, then.' And after signing the papers, off I went, nothing doubting but that I had done a good morning's work, and that the Pequod was the identical ship that Yojo had provided to carry Queequeg and me round the Cape. But I had not proceeded far when I began to bethink me that the captain with whom I was to sail yet remained unseen by me, though indeed in many cases a whale-ship will be completely fitted out, and receive all her crew on board ere the captain makes himself visible by arriving to take command, for sometimes these voyages are so prolonged and the shore intervals at home so exceedingly brief that if the captain have a family or any absorbing concernment of that sort, he does not trouble himself much about his ship in port, but leaves her to the owners till all is ready for sea. However, it is always as well to have a look at him before irrevocably committing yourself into his hands. Turning back, I accosted Captain Peleg, inquiring where Captain Ahab was to be found. "'And what dost thou want of Captain Ahab? It's all right enough, thou art shipped.' "'Yes, but I should like to see him.' "'But I don't think you will be able to at present.' I don't know exactly what's the matter with him, but he keeps close inside the house, a sort of sick, and yet he don't look so. In fact, he ain't sick, but no, he isn't well, either. Anyhow, young man, he won't always see me, so I don't suppose he will thee. He's a queer man, Captain Ahab, so some think, but a good one. 
Oh, thou'lt like him well enough. No fear, no fear. He's a grand, ungodly, godlike man, Captain Ahab. Doesn't speak much, but when he does speak, then you may well listen. Mark ye, be forewarned. Ahab's above the common. Ahab's been in colleges, as well as amongst the cannibals, been used to deeper wonders than the waves, fixed his fiery lance in mightier, stranger foes than whales. His lance, ay, the keenest and the surest that out of all our isle. Oh, he ain't Captain Bildad, no, and he ain't Captain Peleg, he's Ahab, boy. And Ahab of old, thou knowest, was a crowned king. And a very vile one. When that wicked king was slain, the dogs, did they not lick his blood? Come hither to me. Hither, hither, said Peleg, with a significance in his eye that almost startled me. Look ye, lad, never say that on board the Pequod. Never say it anywhere. Captain Ahab did not name himself. Twas a foolish, ignorant whim of his crazy widowed mother, who died when he was only twelve month old. And yet the old squaw, Tistig, at Gayhead, said that the name would somehow prove prophetic. And perhaps other fools like her may tell thee the same. I wish to warn thee. It's a lie. I know Captain Ahab well. I've sailed with him as mate years ago. I know what he is. A good man. Not a pious good man like Bildad, but a swearing good man. Something like me. Only there's a good deal more of him. Ay, ay. I know that he was never very jolly, and I know that on the passage home he was a little out of his mind for a spell. But it was the sharp shooting pains in his bleeding stump that brought that about, as any one might see. I know, too, that ever since he lost his leg last voyage by that accursed whale, he's been a kind of moody, desperate moody and savage sometimes. But that will all pass off. And once for all, let me tell ye and assure thee, young man, it's better to sail with a moody good captain than a laughing bad one. So good-bye to thee, and wrong not Captain Ahab, because he happens to have a wicked name. Besides, my boy, he has a wife, not three voyages wedded, a sweet resigned girl. Think of that. And by that sweet girl that old man has a child. Hold ye then, can there be any utter hopeless harm in Ahab? No, no, my lad. Stricken, blasted if he be, Ahab has his humanities. As I walked away, I was full of thoughtfulness. What had been incidentally revealed to me of Captain Ahab filled me with a certain wild vagueness of painfulness concerning him, and somehow at the time I felt a sympathy and a sorrow for him, but for I don't know what, unless it was the cruel loss of his leg. And yet I also felt a strange awe of him, but that sort of awe which I cannot at all describe was not exactly awe. I do not know what it was, but I felt it, and it did not disincline me towards him, though I felt impatience at what seemed like mystery in him, so imperfectly as he was known to me then. However, my thoughts were at length carried in other directions, so that for the present dark Ahab slipped my mind. End of chapter 16